So welcome back for more AP Research. This week we're going to deal with falsification, meaning you're lying about stuff. Not necessarily that you're lying about your sources, so it's not plagiarism. This is a different level of lying. So it helps if we put ourselves back in context. Where are we in this big picture, or at least the big picture so far? So you came into the class with some type of initial question. From there, what you did was we did some background research in order to build an annotated bibliography. Out of that annotated bibliography, you started to notice that, hey, wait a second, how come this is never being answered? So we've generated an actual research question. From that research question, you got some approvals, and we're working on those still. And from once you have your approvals, what you're now allowed to do is execute some methods and gather some data. How do you figure out your methods? Either you could figure it out yourself or you look at what others have done in the past. For data gathering, well, that was last week and I'm not going to rehash last week. We're going to deal with that data that you're gathering. And this comes from the practical researcher. And I thought it would be a bigger section of the book, but it turns out not to be. And basically, for the sake of reading it to you and being rude, researchers must report their findings in a complete and honest fashion without misrepresentation misrepresenting what they have done or intentionally misleading others about the nature of their findings. And under no circumstances should a researcher fabricate data to support a particular conclusion, no matter how seemingly noble that conclusion might be. Such an action constitutes scientific fraud, plain and simple. Your reply might be, but I'm not doing science, so ha ha. All research now follows science principles, because science was the group that said, hey, this is how we should do research, and everyone else said, hey, that's a pretty good idea. Let's follow suit. So we don't get to make stuff up in any way, shape, or form. The thing is, people have done so. So this is Neil deGrasse Tyson. He didn't do this. But he, he made a really great statement as to how science works, and if you understand how science works, thus you could figure out how research is supposed to work. So this is actually like an hour and a half interview, so I'm only going to do about a minute of this knowing what is true, what is not, and in particular, because like I said, scientists are humans too, and we have bias, and we have all the stuff that goes on with every other human in this world also touches scientists. So we built a system to double check against that. If I am biased, and my bias shows up in some result, because I took some data and not others, and I could have done it this way and not, somebody else is gonna get famous for checking my result and showing that I'm wrong. Well, Dyson is wrong. He messed up here. And if it's shown that I that my bias did influence it, I get a demerit. That's not a real thing, but it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> it will it will interfere with the next time I have an interesting result and I want people to pay attention to it. So there's a huge cost if a scientist is somehow meddling with their data because they have an idea of what they want their data to show. So obviously he's talking just science, but this applies almost anywhere in the world of academic research. This comes from the college board, and I've shown you this slide I don't know how many times before. Before we've focused on the top paragraph, which deals with if you plagiarize, so intentional plagiarism, unintentional plagiarism. The bottom paragraph, however, is the new twist to focus on. So a student who incorporates falsified or fabricated information, that is to say evidence, data, sources, and or authors, will receive a score of zero on that particular component of the AP seminar and or AP research performance assessment task. Meaning, you're making up authors, you're making up papers, you're making up your data, you're making up whatever, because we're going to fact check you. If you're making stuff up, we're going to go after you. And in the world of research, that just basically means you lost your job and you need to find a new line of work. It's not a, oh, well, you know, you got fired from this one, so you move on to another co company. No. Academic research is you lie once, you're done forever. And there are countless examples of this. I am most aware of the science ones because of what I do. But there are other examples. So this study here 
this the super long one? No, this isn't the super long one. But this deals with autism. And it's kind of science-ish. of Neurodevelopmental and Behavioral Pediatrics at the Galasano Children's Hospital at University of Rochester Medical Center. In 1998, a paper was published in The Lancet, which described a case series of children with what was called regressive autism, and suggested that not only did they have lymphonodular hyperplasia, or enlarged lymph nodes in their intestines, but that these children had onset of their symptoms or recognition of their symptoms of autism around the same time that they received their measles, mumps, rubella, or MMR vaccination. So what happened in the ensuing interval is that there became an enormous movement implicating vaccines as a cause of autism. And why is this? Well, part of it is because the symptoms of autism are first recognized in as toddlers in late infancy when language, when language develops, when you see the beginning of social play, and that's right at, at a time that children are getting a series of vaccines. One of the things that we know from other research is that people organize their lives into events, into things like first birthdays, when you've been to the doctor, so it's very easy to use these time periods to remember or to notice when there are differences. So one of the questions has been, what is it that happens in these first 18 months of life that may be associated with the regression you see in about a quarter to a third of children with autism? The epidemiologic studies that have been done do not indicate that the MMR vaccine, given as a single combined entity, is associated with the recognition of symptoms of autism. The initial retraction related to the lack of disclosure of payment. One of the things that's really very important in research is for us to believe the research. We have to believe that sub human subjects are treated in an ethical fashion, that they gave appropriate consent. We have to believe that the authors um, record correct information, that the information that's being reported is accurate as they know it. We have to believe that appropriate statistics are being done and that information is not being withheld so that the evidence as, as submitted for peer review is as accurate as the investigator knows it to be. And I think that the reason why this has become such an important area to, to discuss is bigger than just MMR and autism even though for parents of children with autism who've been worried all these years, that's plenty big. But it's really for us to trust the literature that in this day and age, what we need to do is to have evidence-based practice. We need to be using good data to treat people. You know, we live in an age of information. We live in an age where you can turn on your computer and have access to information almost quicker then you can toast a piece of bread. So in this day and age, what I'm hoping is that this is a wake up call for us to look at the evidence, the evidence behind all of our beliefs. And what I'm hoping is that with this, that there can be a coming together of scientists in the autism community to agree to look at the evidence and to look at the evidence in an open and scientifically appropriate fashion. But this autism study, and we've watched a few and listened to a few things about autism already, one of the things that made it worrisome was it was how the data turned out to be used. It was cherry picking. There was a little bit of financial uh-ohs. The result was the paper had to be retracted. So it was totally the paper or the journal said, yeah, sorry, we shouldn't have done this. The author said, yeah, I shouldn't have done that and he lost his license and he doesn't get to do research or medicine anymore. So lying about stuff is a bad idea. You, it's bad if you lie about your where your ideas are coming from, so when it's plagiarism, but it's also equally as bad when you are lying about your data and conclusions you're drawing. Here's another example of research going wrong. This one actually deals with a little bit of psychology 
and a little bit of sociology, so this is more of the social science side. A controversial study that claimed a brief conversation with a gay canvasser could change people's minds about same-sex marriage has been retracted, despite the author's objections. The study appeared in the prestigious journal Science and made national headlines when it was published last December. The takeaway message was that talking to a gay person for 20 minutes could make people rethink their opinions about same-sex marriage, a very interesting finding for activists of all kinds. Well, up to a year later, they had changed their beliefs and they had even changed the beliefs of other people that they lived with. It can happen that fast that somebody could reach out to somebody and within 20 minutes open up their mind if they have the right message. I mean, I can do it with my students in 30 seconds. But just a few months later, Stanford researchers announced their attempt to replicate the study had failed miserably. What's more, they said study author Michael LaCour's data looked suspicious. They couldn't even get a response rate close to what LaCour had reported, let alone change as many people's minds. Science issued an expression of concern about the study and began investigating the data, eventually issuing a retraction Thursday afternoon. Like all major retractions, this one led to articles explaining why the peer review process is imperfect, how journalists should be more skeptical, and how academia gives scientists the wrong incentives. But what's interesting here is that throughout the controversy, LaCour said he could back up his findings. After the Stanford paper criticized him, he said on Twitter he was gathering evidence for a comprehensive response and said in a statement on his website that he stands by his findings. But now that journalists have begun digging into LaCour's work, they found other inconsistencies. Institutions he claimed gave him grant money told BuzzFeed they've never given him a penny. And New York Magazine found his CV listed a teaching award he never received. The whole ordeal put Columbia University professor Donald Green, who co-authored the paper with LaCour, in an awkward spot. He's the one who ultimately asked science to retract the paper. He told the New York Times he never saw LaCour's data and gave the then graduate student the benefit of the doubt. He told the paper, it's a very delicate situation when a senior scholar makes a move to look at a junior scholar's data set. This is his career, and if I reach in and grab it, it may seem like I'm boxing him out. Critics say Green was too trusting and that LaCour's findings were so extraordinary and experienced scientists should have taken a closer look. It's not clear what will happen to LaCour if he isn't able to answer his critics. He's currently a PhD candidate at UCLA. For Newsy, I'm Christian Bryant. We're all humans, but we're going to fact check you. Another famous example came from this gentleman who was Belgian? I don't remember where he's from, but his name is Diedrich Stapel, and he ended up writing a whole bunch of stuff on psychology and trying to, or the science with psychology and stuff like that, and he had a whole bunch of papers, and I think there's like 19 of them or something crazy like that. And every single one of them turned out to be fabricated. All of his data sets turned out to be fabricated. Uh, he also had PhD students, and it was like his, his students' work was called, were called into question, but they double-checked, and they're like, okay, yeah, we won't punish the students for your boss being an idiot. But... Lying is a bad thing. Don't don't make up data because at some point you will get caught. There are enough people who are trolls in the world who wish to see, did you really do what you say you did, that eventually you'll get caught. So let's just not do it. So what should you be doing? You should just be honest. When doubt, be honest about what's going on. So if you have data and you don't want to show it, you know... Uh, or, sorry, let me rephrase that. So, if you have data and you have one thing that you were thinking of demonstrating, and that's not what your data are demonstrating, okay, moving on with life. If you didn't gather all the data that you wanted, so you feel like, oh, I need to add more to it, well, uh, okay, you just didn't have enough. Moving on with life. Whatever you get, let it speak for itself. You don't need to add, you don't need to subtract, just let it all out. Typically, in when you have research papers, that what you'll get is a link somewhere that says, hey, you want to see all of our data? Here it turns out to be. So if you want to back, you know, you want to fact check us, please fact check us. So when in doubt, just be honest. Honesty is good.